Praise be Jesus Christ, and thank you for joining me for this 19th lesson in the Animode course. This 19th lesson is going to be talking about two of the four E's in Animode, and that is exile to Emmanuel. So we'll be talking about the exile of the Jewish people. This is the exile that lasted 70 years, and it took place right after uh, Bab the Babylonian came in, uh, the Babylonian Empire came in, destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, uh, brought the people um, into exile for 70 years. Um, it was especially before and after that time, and then waiting for the Messiah, that there was this hope of the Emmanuel, of the, of the Messiah, um, of the promised one that would come, and Emmanuel means God with us. So we will find, of course, this is God with us, and we'll take that into the next lesson as well. And so what I want to do in this lesson is um, talk about the exile and the anticipation that the people had for Jesus Christ. And where is Jesus Christ prophesied in the Old Testament uh, so that we can see that there is this expectation for him. And just like they had the expectation during their exile for Jesus Christ's first coming, we, have an, we in our exile will have an anticipation for his second coming. So Genesis 49.10 The scepter shall not be taken away from Judah, nor a ruler from his thigh, till he come that is to be sent and he shall be the expectation of nations. This is in Genesis 49. Jacob is speaking this to his sons, and it's a promise of the fact that Jew the Jewish people will continue to have their kings, that kings will come from the line of Judah. And this is true, we'll see this in just a second. Uh, we do need to remember, however, even though the kings still came from the line of Judah, there was no kingdom, no throne uh, after the exile. And so from 597 BC, um, all of this hard work that David had done to establish a kingdom, uh, the kingdom was divided and then the Babylonian exile. So uh, Zedekiah was taken away from Ju uh, Jerusalem. You can see this here, he's, he's captivated. He is uh, kind of the last king that was there in Jerusalem on the throne, um, the line of Judah. Um, now, St. Augustine tells us, former times are examined and we find that the Jews always had their kings of the tribe of Judah and had no foreign king before that Herod who was king when the Lord was born. And so what we have here is we, we, we see that there's always going to be kings in the line of Judah except for when Herod comes. Now Numbers talks about how there will be a star, a star of Jacob that will arise and that the scepter will be returned. So we see that the scepter has left. Um, but the scepter will return. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not near. A star shall rise out of Jacob, and the scepter shall spring up from Israel. This is Jesus Christ. He is of the tribe of Judah. He is that star. Out of Jacob shall he come, that shall rule, and shall destroy the remains of the city. So Jesus Christ brings back the legitimate king kingship of Jerusalem. He is the king of kings. Um, he is the one that will have the scepter. He will rule. He was the legitimate king of the Jews. Um, not Herod is not, and he is of the, the tribe of Judah. Herod is not. And so he, of course, uh, on the cross, um, there will be the declaration, I-N-R-I, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. This is a statement that's made by Pontius Pilate. Um, and so we see that, yes, the scepter does return, and there is the new king, the king of kings, Jesus Christ. Daniel talks about, and this is Gabriel actually speaking to Daniel, that there will be 69 weeks of years, and it'll be at that time that then um, the Savior will come. Know thou therefore, and take notice, that from the going forth of the word to build up Jerusalem again unto Christ the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, and the street shall be built again, and the walls in straightness of times. So if you take this uh, number, uh, 69, and you multiply that by seven, then you get to 483 years. Uh, the temple was complete around 516 BC, and so if you subtract that, 483 years, that puts you right at about 33 BC, so around three decades before Jesus Christ will be born. Um, and what do we find there? Well, we find that it's about 36 BC that King Herod will be the first foreign king. Um, so when you match those when you match those prophecies together, Daniel's timeline, and then the fact that um, the the scepter will leave, then you have all that lining up, and of course um, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Emmanuel, God with us, about to be born and about to save us.
Everything in salvation history is going to center on Jesus Christ, the Emmanuel, God with us. And so we see that we will fall, but we will rise. We have the fall of Cain, we have the fall of Babel, we have the rise of the Ark, the rise of the sons of Jacob. All of this taking place during the time of Adam and Noah and Abraham is going to point us to Jesus Christ. In the Roman martyrology, we say, in the year from the creation of the world, when the beginning God created heaven and earth, 5,199 years, of course, we have been waiting for God with us, Emmanuel. From the flood, 2,957 years, and from the birth of Abraham, 2,015 years. So this countdown that will continue to move um, throughout salvation history. And so we have these falls. We see that Cain kills Abel. We see the, the Babel, the people revolting against God. But we have the hope. We have the, the salvation of the ark. All those that are in the ark are saved. We have the 12 sons of Jacob, which will become the 12 tribes of the nation. And all of this, all of this is pointing us to Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. And the next set, we see kind of this next section with Moses. And we have that there is another kind of exile with Egypt. Um, but we are given the law. We are then given the kingdom with David. And so now you have this next section, Moses and David. And these great heroes of the Jewish faith, um, the great leader, the one that rescued them, the liberator, and then the king. Um, these two are going to only be leading us to Emmanuel. They're only going to be a type of Jesus Christ who will come. So we continue our countdown from Moses and the coming of the Israelites out of Egypt, 1,510 years to Christ, and then from the anointing of King David, 1,032 years before Jesus Christ. So all of this, going back even plus 5,000 years, is all setting us up for one thing, the coming of Jesus Christ true God and true man, Emmanuel, God with us. His coming comes in the 65th week, according to the prophecy of Daniel, which we spoke of earlier, in the 194th Olympiad, in the year 752 from the foundation or the founding of the city of Rome, in the 42nd year of the empire of Octavian Augustus, when the whole world was at peace in the sixth age of the world. Jesus Christ, eternal God and Son of the Eternal Father, desirous to sanctify the world by his most merciful coming, ha having been conceived of the Holy Ghost and nine months having elapsed since his conception, is born in Bethlehem of Judah, having become man of the Virgin Mary. This is the gospel. This is the good news. This is what we have been waiting for and everything is geared off of this. Everything before was counting down to this and if you notice everything after is going to point back to this that's why we say that this is the year of our Lord right on anno domini AD this is 2020 AD 2021 2022 so we mark everything off of the birth of our Lord and before everything was counting down to the birth of our Lord Everything really intensifies during the time of the exile because every, you know this 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 height of the kingdom is now crushed, and the Jewish people are brought low into the exile. But they will slowly then have the hope for the God with us, Emmanuel. That Emmanuel will be manifested through the Epiphany, which we'll talk about in the next lesson. And that Epiphany finally will find its its full completion in, of course, the new and everlasting covenant, the new and eternal covenant the Eucharist. Um, and it'll be in the Eucharist that God is not only with us, Emmanuel, but that God stays with us in the Eucharist, in the sacraments, and that we have the hope and the promise that we will be with him for all eternity. The time frame here for the four E's is important because you have the exile of the Babylonian exile, the, the fall of the, the Jewish people. During this time, there's an amazing hope for the Emmanuel. And so the exile lasts 70 years, and then there's going to be this 500 years of anticipation and hope uh, for the coming of the Messiah. And then you have when Jesus is born, uh, you have a 30-year period before he manifests himself and enters then into his three-year public ministry, which will culminate really with the Passion, the Death, and the Resurrection, which is Holy Thursday, the Lord's Supper, Good Friday, the Crucifixion, and then, of course, Easter Sunday, the Resurrection. And so then there's that, uh, again, the long period of time, the 70-year exile, um, the long period of time of waiting 30 years of, of, of since the hidden life of Jesus Christ, and then the three-year ministry. 
what we see in this diagram is that we are people of hope and we rise with Jesus Christ, right? We, we want to move up. We don't want to move down. We want that incline, that blue arrow up. And so we have the exile, we have the Emmanuel, we have the Epiphany, we have the Eucharist, always up, always up. We are climbing the holy hill. We want to go upwards with Jesus Christ. And so this is reflected in the Psalms, this is reflected in our liturgy, that we want to move up. We want to ascend to the mountain of God. We want to go to heaven. This is our journey. Psalm 83, 6 through 7. Blessed is the man whose help is from you. He has fixed his heart upon the steps of his ascent. It's so important. The steps of his ascent from the valley of tears where he once placed himself. So we see we always placed ourselves, but now we want to move up. We see the steps of this ascent most perfectly in the Mass. And in the Mass, we actually ascend that. We climb the holy hill. Send forth thy light and true light. They have conducted me and brought me unto thy holy hill and into thy tabernacles. And I will go unto the altar of God, to God who giveth joy to my youth. This is Psalm 42, 3 through 4. So we are actually in exile. Because of original sin and the consequences of original sin, we are currently in exile. But God is calling us to himself. Abraham was called out of the city of Babel. He was called out of that area. Um, legend says it that he actually refused to help build that temple. Um, one of very few that refused, but he was called out of that. Moses was called out from Egypt and then called back to get the people out of Egypt. So they had hope in the first coming. Abraham, Moses, David, all the Israelite people had hope in the Emmanuel. We now have hope in the second coming. So even though the Jewish people, yes, were in exile and yes, fell many times, they always had a hope of the coming Messiah, the promised one. We, although we are now in exile, have hope for Jesus Christ to return. We know that he is now with us, um, but we also know he's in heaven and that he will come again. We are a people of hope, in exile, but a people of hope. And so we see this uh, four E's and this rise in a different way. We see that our exile is now a time in this world but God will come and be with us in the second coming. We know that we will see him in his glory and we want and desire to be with him forever, life everlasting in heaven. One of the most beautiful prayers in our church, probably one of the most famous chants is actually the Save Regina. Um, I will go ahead and put a link to that so you can hear that, but it's uh, you can just do a search too, the Save Regina, one of the most famous chants in our church. And the Save Regina actually talks about this exile that we currently have in the world. Um, it dates back to at least the 1200s, so it's been around for 800 years. Um, and some of the things that we say, we say that we're poor, banished children of Eve. We're recognizing the consequence of original sin, that we have sighs, mourning, and weeping in this valley of tears, right? We're in the valley of making the ascent up. After this, our exile, we ask Our Lady to share with us the fruit of her womb. What is the fruit of her womb? It is Jesus Christ. It's the fruit that hangs on the tree, which is the Eucharist. So although we are in exile, we are not called to be idle. We are called to work in the vineyard. While we're in exile, we are called to work. We are also called to bear fruit. We should not be barren. We should bear fruit. And while we are in exile, we are not to be blind by the darkness of this world, by the false teachings of the world. We are to see Christ in this exile, and we are to welcome Christ in this exile. So it's very clear that we can't just beat ourselves up, trudge around in, in misery, that we recognize the reality that, yes, I am in exile, but while I'm in this exile, I'm supposed to act a certain way. I am called to work, not be idle. I am called to bear fruit, not to be barren. And I am called to see and welcome Christ, not to be blinded by the darkness. There's a season in the church that's been practiced traditionally called Septagesima. Septagesima just means 70 days before Easter. And so it's kind of like a pre-Lent countdown. And, and we're going to look at some readings from that. But the 70 days here is actually remembering or recalling the 70 days, 70 years, sorry, of, of the Babylonian exile. And so we have this pre-Lent countdown. Uh, it's reflected also in uh, sometimes if a church has bells, traditionally they would ring the bells, the church bells in the tower. They would ring them 30 minutes before Mass, 15 minutes before Mass, and then 5 minutes before Mass. And so there's this sense of our human nature needs to get ready for things. Uh, whether it's mass or whether it's for a dinner or whether it's for a big event and so we have this countdown to things and that's what actually this season this pre-Lenten season Septogazima 
gives us. And so we, we look at some readings that are given to us 70 days before Easter, approximately 60 days before Easter, Easter Sextagesima, and then 50 days before Easter, Quinquagesima, and then we actually get into what we call Quadragesima, which is the 40 days of Lent. And so these are helpful as we remember that we actually are in exile. And so we'll look at these. Uh, first the one that is 70 days prior, and then 60, and then 50. In this illustration, we'll look at these precious Gospels that are given to us by the Church during her liturgical year, 70 days prior to Easter, 60 days, and 50 days. Uh, so the workers of the Vineyard uh, Gospel, Matthew 21 through 16, is a call out of our idleness. We are to do the work of God. And the work of God, we enter into this larger salvation history in which God has done His work from the time of Adam, then through Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, the exile on. And now we are called into this great drama, into this great work. Um, we are called to be workers in the vineyard. We read in this gospel, Go you also into my vineyard, and I will give you what shall be just. This is the owner of the vineyard. He says, Why stand you here all day idle? Go you also into my vineyard. So the main lesson here is that we as Christians are not to be idle. We are to listen to the voice of God and to come and work in his vineyard. So we see here different times of day, six, nine, noon, three, five, and six, right? 12 hour period here. He goes in the third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour, and the 11th hour. And these actually in a spiritual sense represent the periods of time in salvation history. Adam to Noah, Noah to Abraham is the second one, Abraham to Moses is the third one, and then this final period is Moses, David, and the prophets to the Emmanuel. Jesus comes at the 11th hour, um, and it, it is for the Jews to, of course, are called into the vineyard, but then it's at the 11th hour that also then the Gentiles are called into this work. So everyone is called to work into the vineyard. No one should stay in idleness. Why do you remain idle? This is also meant to talk about the periods of our own life. Um, and so if a man lives 80 or 90 years, he's going to be a child, a youth, an adult, and then old age. God is calling us. We cannot remain idle. Uh, we must, um, we can't wait. This is why this gospel is so important, uh, especially um, 70 days prior to Easter, because we are to rise to new life. Jesus Christ has come, he has died, he has risen, he has saved us. Don't remain in your sin, don't remain in your idleness, but now is the time of salvation. Arise, work, do what he is asking you to do. He loves you, he wants you, he calls you. One of my favorite quotes regarding this is that our life really is a work to be accomplished and that God wills that. Uh, we see sometimes our life as a series of sensations to be experienced rather than a work to be accomplished. And John Paul II in one of his encyclicals talks about this, that we shouldn't see our life as a series of sensations to be experienced, but a work to be accomplished. But it often happens that people are discouraged from creating the proper conditions for human reproduction and are led to consider themselves and their lives as a series of sensations to be experienced rather than as a work to be accomplished. So although in this encyclical, G, uh, Pope John Paul II is actually talking about uh, a marriage and having babies within marriage and that that is the work to accomplish rather than just living a selfish lifestyle and, and seeing your life as a series of sensations, even though he's talking about the sacrament of matrimony here and creating that beautiful environment in the sacrament of matrimony for children, um, this can be applied actually to anything. This can just be applied in general that our life, my life, is not a series of sensations to be experienced. It's not one sensation after another. My life is meant to be a work, a work to be accomplished, the accomplishment of the will of God. The next uh, gospel that we look, which will be 60 days before Easter, is Luke 8, 4 through 6. This is the uh, sower and the, uh, the seed, the parable of the sower and the seed, and it talks about how we should not be barren, but rather we should bear fruit. We need to do the work. So before in the vineyard, we kind of saw salvation history and the work of God, how God has worked throughout history. Now we're going to really look at how the expectation of man is to work with God, to cooperate with God, to bear fruit. And so we move from idleness to work, and what will that work do? That work, as we work with God, will bear the fruit that we are supposed to bear. It's in this parable of the seed and the sower um, that we actually have Jesus himself interpret this parable for us. That only happens two times in the gospel. And so we know that the seed is actually the word of God. 
and the sower is Jesus Christ himself. And so he is sowing that word of God. He gives us four conditions that can happen with that seed, with that word of God in our heart. And so we're going to look at that. Um, the one that we want is this one here, but that on the good ground, we want to be the good ground, are they who in a good and perfect heart, hearing the word, keep it and bring forth fruit and patience. So our goal is to hear the word of God, to keep the word of God, and to bring forth fruit from the word of God. That is our goal. Um, so again, we don't want to be idle. We want to be called into the work of God. What is the work of God? To do this exactly, to bring forth fruit fruit. Um, we know that um, actually St. Paul talks about in Romans 10, I'm not sure, I think it's Romans 10, 13, somewhere around there, um, but Paul tells us very clearly that um, there's, a, there's a, procession, a, a progression that really has to take place uh, from the apostles even to our time, and that is those, who, those will be saved who call upon the name of the Lord. Uh, you will only call upon the name of the Lord if you believe. You only believe if you hear, and you can only hear if someone has been um, preached, to, someone has preached to you, and someone will only preach to you if they have been sent. And so if you see at the bottom here, you see that it's important that, that apostles are sent. Jesus Christ did that, right? Matthew 28, go forth to all nations, right? He sent them. They preach the gospel. They preach the gospel so that we can hear it, if we hear it, then we can either believe or not. Let's say we believe. If we believe, we need to call upon the name of the Lord. And when we call upon the name of the Lord, we will be saved. Um, how we call upon the name of the Lord is obviously through the sacraments. If we believe, then we are baptized and then we are saved. But this is going to be an important pattern and we're going to connect it to uh, this gospel and the other three scenarios. So remember the first one is that we hear the word of God and then we keep it and then we bring it forth and so we're going to see something a little bit different in these next three examples that our Lord gives us and they by the wayside so this is the group that's by the wayside or the ground are they that hear then the devil cometh and taketh the word out of their heart less believing they should be saved so if we connect this to what Paul is saying this group definitely hears so someone has been sent someone preaches they've heard the gospel they hear it but the devil takes that seed. He takes that before they can actually believe. And how many people does this happen to? They've heard something about the gospel, but they lack that belief. They've heard about the Jesus. They've heard about Jesus Christ. They've heard about the church. They've heard about the sacraments, but they don't have that belief. And then we have another situation. And that which fell among thorns are they who have heard and going their way are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life and yield no fruit. Again, we have another category of a person that just hears, but then it stops there. So they hear, but there's no indication of belief, there's no indication of calling upon, and there's no indication of any type of fruit, especially the fruit of salvation. So hearing is not enough. Hearing the Word of God is necessary, but hearing the Word of God needs to lead to a belief which would be keeping the word of God, and then a bearing fruit. We have another uh, situation where now they, upon the rock, um, are they who, when they hear it, receive the word with joy, and these have no roots, for they believe for a while, and in time of temptation they fall away. So this one, this third one's a little bit different than the other two. The other two, the people heard it, but didn't really lead to a belief. This one, they're going to hear it, and they're going to believe for a while, our Lord says. Believe for a while, but then they fall away. This would be apostasy. So we have two groups that hear the word of God, but because of riches, because of temptations, because of the devil, it ends up going from hearing, but it never gets to belief. In this situation right here, in this third one, it does move to belief, but the belief does not have final perseverance. In other words, in this one, they don't keep the word and they don't bear fruit. It's only there for a while, and then they fall away, which would be apostasy, leaving the faith. Um, so we really need to heed these words. There are four, four categories here, and three of them fail. Three of them do not bear fruit. Three of them are not saved. It's just that 25%. It's just that, that, that one in which the people hear it, keep it, and bring forth the word of God. So we see in these Gospels the very clear message that we are called out of idleness 
to the work of God. What is the work of God? It is to bear fruit. He wants us to bear that fruit. Jesus Christ is the first fruits. We are the continuation of that fruit, continuing to live in Christ and bear fruit. Uh, we can bear fruit in many different ways. First and foremost is to have the Word of God always with us, that spiritual reading daily to just be entrenched in the Word of God. We also have what are the states in life. We have religious and consecrated life, holy orders, and matrimony. And if you can look um, on that last uh, column, we see that there are special, special fruits that are connected to each one of these states in life. And this is our vocation, our calling, our calling to the work of God to bear fruit. Uh, therefore, in the church, everyone, whether belonging to the hierarchy or being cared for by it, is called to holiness according to the saying of the apostle, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. So you can especially look here at 1 Thessalonians 4.3 and Ephesians 1.4, that we are called to holiness. This is a universal call to holiness. What does it mean to be holy? It means to be like Christ. Just as Christ bore fruit, we also will bear fruit in Christ. And so we do this, typically there are three states in life in which we are able to have, in a sense, I guess you could say the vineyard, in which we are able to bear fruit. Um, these states in life are the religious and consecrated, which is for male and female, priesthood, which is for male only, and matrimony, which is, of course, one man and one woman. Um, so what about the single life? Well, the single life, typically you are discerning, you are getting to know yourself, you are praying, you are fasting, you are having spiritual reading, and you are listening to God's call in your life to accept one of those states in life. In this illustration, we're going to look at the three states in life, um, and these are, we'll look at them one at a time. We'll have religious life, and these uh, people in religious life are making a commitment to live solely for Jesus Christ, to remove themselves from the world, and to be have this intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, like a marriage to Jesus Christ. This is poverty, chastity, and obedience. They are committing to, to live out through a vow, promising, making a vow, to live out what we call the evangelical counsels. These are the, this is what Christ lived, a life of poverty, chastity, and obedience. What they are doing, simply put, is they are doing what we will always, what, what all of us will do in heaven. This is the perfect calling because they are going to be living out here on earth what all of us will live out in heaven. This intimacy, this union with Jesus Christ. Um, this is spoken about from Jesus in Matthew 19. For there are eunuchs who were born so from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made so by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven. He that can take, let him take it. So Jesus Christ himself is saying this is a perfect way of life. This is a perfect state to um, be a virgin, to give yourself completely to Jesus Christ, to have that union with God and to live that union that we will all experience in heaven. And these people that commit, commit to this life, uh, these religious brothers and sisters and nuns and monks and consecrated, they are all basically a sign of heaven for us. Um, St. Paul says the same thing. For I would that all men were even as myself, but everyone hath his proper gift from God, one after this manner and one after that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them to, if they so continue, even as I. So he is suggesting, we heard Jesus' words about how this is important, and those who can take it should take this life, uh, could should take this option. Um, Paul says the same thing. Um, if you are able to go ahead and do this, um, I really want to stress here the fact that every young man and every young woman should consider this life and should consider this life first because if you're considering everything and what God may be calling you to, it is such a beautiful thing to have this intimacy with Him. The next would be holy orders. Holy orders would be the spiritual fruit, especially through the sacraments, and we'll see this in just a second. Um, but the holy orders kind of become a bridge between heaven and earth. So the religious life is really focused on living what we will live in heaven. Holy orders kind of has a foot in heaven and a foot on earth because um, our priests are really our pontifex. They're our bridge. They are going to bring the graces of heaven to us, namely in the sacraments, and they're going to bring those of us that are on exile on earth to heaven. That's their goal, is to bring us, like shepherds, us lost sheep. There are shepherds that bring us 
to this spiritual life. And so they are like a bridge. The priest is the minister of Christ, an instrument that is to save in the hands of the divine redeemer. He continues the work of redemption in all its world embracing universality and divine efficacy. That work that wrought so marvelous a transformation in the world. So here again, they're not removing themselves from the world and living strictly what we will live in heaven. They are actually concentrating on heaven and as a minister bringing heaven to the world, transforming the world and bringing us kind of out of that into these graces. So they, in a, the best way I can example, like in the illustration is just a bridge, bringing the graces of heaven to us, bringing us to God. Thus the priest, as is said with good reason, is indeed another Christ, for in some way he is himself a continuation of Christ. What a beautiful saying. The priest is another Christ. What do we see? That Christ came down from heaven. He lived among us, brings us to the divine. As the Father has sent me, I also send you, is spoken to the priest. And hence the priest, like Christ, continues to give glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men of goodwill. This is the encyclical of Pope Pius XI. Those who hear the call to religious life and enter into it are committing to the life of heaven, an intimacy and a union of heaven while they're here on earth. Those who hear the call to holy orders and enter into it are going to bring the graces of heaven to us, bearing that spiritual fruit and bringing us to those graces. And those who hear the call to marriage, matrimony, and enter into it, their primary focus is going to be on that physical, that material fruit to people that are living in earth but trying to get themselves and their family to heaven. And so Dietrich von Hildebrand kind of expresses this beautifully um, when he says that love is the primary meaning of marriage. Love is the primary meaning of marriage, just as the birth of new human beings is the primary end. So here we have two, a distinction here. We have the primary meaning. The meaning of marriage is love. There is nothing more loving than looking at another person and saying, I love your soul, I care for your soul and body, and I want your soul and your body to be saved and be forever with Jesus Christ in heaven. That is the most loving thing we can do. In fact, to not care for the body and soul and to not care to get someone to heaven is not very loving. So marriage is about getting each other to heaven, the salvation of souls. Um, the end of the primary end, there are other ends of marriage, but the primary end of marriage is the birth of new human beings. This is the physical fruit that comes from marriage. Just like holy orders has a spiritual fruit, matrimony has a material or a physical fruit. And so you can just see that holy orders is really a primary focus of taking care of souls and the spiritual well-being of the souls. This is why the Eucharist and confession, the nourishment, the food, and the healing is so important. And then matrimony is really caring about um, that physical, the, the body and the soul, but caring about actually physically, physically feeding these new babies and physically healing these new ba babies and bringing their souls to the church, to the priest, so they can be cared for their souls. Now we're going to look at that last gospel in this uh, three-part series. This, is, this comes 50 days before Easter, and this is really dealing with darkness, how we are not called to stay in the darkness, but like the blind man, we want to say to Jesus, Lord, that I may see. Right? So Jesus says to him, what wilt thou that I do to thee? What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man says, Lord, that I may see. And each of us in the midst of this dark world, in the midst of so many lies and empty promises, uh, we want to say, Lord, help me to see, that I may see the truth, that I may see the way, that I may see the life, because Jesus Christ is that truth, that way, and that life. We want to see that. Like the blind man that is begging to see Jesus, we want to see Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us, I want to see you, God, with me. I don't see you, and I want to see you with me. Um, and St. Bernard, Bernard really talks about the three comings of Christ and how important it is for us to see Christ at these three times. Um, Christ is indeed there. He might be visible or invisible in these comings, but Christ indeed is showing up. So we beg and we beg through our prayer, God, help me to see you. We know that there are three comings of the Lord. The third lies between the other two. It is invisible while the other two are visible. In this illustration, we see the three comings of Christ. The first and the second are both visible. 
um, the nativity and the second coming. And then the third is invisible. Um, it's when Jesus comes in our heart. Um, it's the time that we now are living. So that third one is the time we are living in now. When we focus on the first coming of Christ, we see that this is his nativity, his incarnation. Jesus born in Bethlehem. And this will bring about our redemption. In his first coming, he was seen on earth, dwelling among men. He himself testifies that they saw him and hated him. So it's actually visible. They see him and hate him. In his first coming, our Lord came in the flesh and in our weakness. In the first, Christ was our redemption. Why did he come? He came to live, to die, to redeem us. So this first coming of Jesus Christ is a visible coming. We can actually see him. We see him in our weakness and we see him in our flesh. Many people saw him that way and thus they did not believe because uh, he was not what they were expecting. And so this promised Emmanuel, um, he was not exactly what they were expecting. He wasn't this majestic king that was uh, destroying the Roman army, but instead he was a very humble son of a carpenter um, living out a simple, very hidden, simple life. Um, and the second coming will also be visible. This will be very different, though, than the first coming. This is the day of wrath, the second coming. In the final second coming, all flesh will see the salvation of our God, and they will look on him whom they pierced. So everyone will indeed see him. In the final coming, he will be seen in glory and majesty, very different than his first coming. In the last, he will appear as our life. So in this second coming, which is what we are anticipating now, um, it will be a day of wrath. He will not be silent, but in, and instead it will be glorious and magnificent trumpet blast. Uh, he will not be like a lamb, but rather he will be more like a lion. And whereas sometimes people did not see him before um, because they were not interested, you cannot escape the second coming. Everyone will know. Everyone will look upon him who they pierced. And then he will be either our life or our death if we have accepted him or rejected him. And then we have this third coming, which is right now in every day of our life, the time in between, which is invisible. The intermediate, the third coming, is a hidden one. In it, only the elect see the Lord within their own selves, and they are saved. We want to see you, Jesus, Lord, that I may see you. In this middle coming, he comes in spirit and in power, and the importance of the Holy Spirit living within us. Because this coming lies between the other two, it is like a road on which we travel from the first coming to the last. So why do we believe in this third coming? Because we believe in the first and we believe in the last. In this middle coming, he is our rest and our consolation. So um, again, to stress on the third, this coming that we are in right now when Jesus comes into our heart in an invisible way, we don't see him physically. We, he comes in power, he comes in spirit, but we don't see him physically in the flesh. So there is a difference between a person that sees Jesus Christ and a person that does not see him. As Christians, we are called out of that darkness to see Jesus Christ every day in our life. If we do not see him, we want to make sure that we say, like the blind man, Lord, that I may see you. Help me to see you. And I want to just share that the reason we would see him in this third stage um, this hidden, this bridge, is because we believe that he actually came the first time. Now, we did not see him the first time, but we know that there are people that saw him, and they have told us the gospel. So we have heard it, and we have kept it. We have believed it, and we have called upon him, and thus we are being saved. Um, and that is what this third is all about. That's what this third coming is all about. We also know that he will come again and we will see him. We will either see him upon our death or we will, we will see him when he comes again. St. Bernard finishes off by telling us, let it, God's word, enter into your very being. Let it take possession of your desires, your whole way of life. That's what this third coming is, that each day we allow into our heart Jesus Christ the invisible king, right? Um, our heart becomes like a manger where the baby Jesus will rest. Um, our heart becomes like a throne where Christ the king will be enthroned and he will reign. And so we want to give Jesus Christ, our invisible king, our Lord, our divine guest, we want to give him all of our heart.
all of it. Cardinal Sarah has some beautiful teaching about actually allowing Jesus to take everything. Certainly we believe that God dwells and lives in us, but very often we never allow him the freedom to live, act, move, and express himself. We occupy all the ground of our interior landscape all day long and endlessly. So what you can think here, uh, an analogy that I like, is if you think of your heart now not as a manger or not as a throne, but if you think of your heart as a piece of land, let's say maybe 40 acres of land, are you going to give Jesus Christ two acres on the corner, maybe a corner that, that you're, is far off from your home, or are you going to give him all 40 acres? Um, and this is the challenge, is to give Jesus Christ everything. My whole heart belongs to you. Um, there's a beautiful prayer called the Todos Tuos prayer, totally yours. And it's a prayer really in the words of Mary, associating with Mary and saying, Mary, I want to be like you. I want to have your heart. I want to give your son Jesus everything. And so it says, um, I belong to you entirely. All that I possess is yours. I take you into everything that is in mine. Everything that is mine, give me your heart, Mary. So it's a prayer to Mary asking that we may have a heart like she had to give everything to her son. Everything, absolutely everything. She gave everything from the Annunciation all the way to the cross and beyond. She gave all of those acreage to her son Jesus. So in this next illustration, we can kind of uh, maybe uh, see what this would look like, the acreage of our heart. Uh, so let's say part of that uh, is our hobbies, or the hobbies that we have, the leisure, the entertainment. A uh, good rule of thumb in all of these areas right here, our, our entertainment is one, is it pleasing to Jesus Christ? That's a way that we can give it to him. And then two, is it in moderation? Um, in the next area, that maybe a little bit, they're going to get more important as we get to the center, is our job, our chores, our career, our duties. These, are, of course, are things that we must do to live. Um, it, again, if we're in the state of life, if we're a single person or if we're married, um, these are things that we must do to sustain our life, the basic necessities. But, of course, they need to never contradict the morals. Um, so going back to this, um, or in the, actually in the next circle, would be the states in life. So we're getting a little bit closer to things that help us to live out that holy life. And this the states in life, again, would be religious or consecrated life, the priesthood, and matrimony. Since the state in life is, is really now um, uh, closer to the middle, we see its importance. What is the role of the, the consecrated, the religious life, the role of the priest, the role of matrimony is to make a person holy. So you can see that um, obviously our state in life is much more important than our duties or our job. And, and that is much more important than even our entertainment. And so therefore in the church, again, everyone, whether belonging to the hierarchy or being cared for by it, is called to holiness, the call to holiness, according to the saying of the apostle, for it is the will of God, your sanctification. What is God's will for you? to be saved, your holiness, your sanctification. The holiness is the center of your life. Everything else is around that. Everything else supports that. Holiness is in the middle, and then your state in life is, is to support that. Uh, so if you are a priest, if you're called to the priesthood, that priesthood is going to be what will make you the holiest. If you're called to consecrated life, that is what will make you the holiest. If you're called to marriage, that was what will assist in your holiness. Um, and then outside of that, you have your job, and outside of that, you have your entertainment. A wonderful, maybe the best example of this call to holiness is the story of Mary and Martha. And the Lord answering said to her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and art troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary hath chosen the best part, which shall not be taken away from her. Luke 10, 41 and 42. So we have this, um, this, this, these duties, these jobs, these chores, and those are important. And, and Martha is, is not scolded for that. Um, but the most important part is that inner circle, that holiness, and sitting at the feet of Jesus, paying attention to Jesus, um, choosing that best part, that one thing necessary. And so we, we do have a lot of things in life. We do have entertainment. We do have careers, chores, duties. We do have our state in life, whether it's consecrated life, religious life, priesthood, or matrimony. Um, but at the center of all of that is always holiness. Holiness is the one thing necessary, and holiness will not be taken from us. The only possible way, Jesus assures us, that Satan cannot take him away from us. So if we are going to lose holiness, if we are going to lose Jesus Christ, the one thing necessary, there's only um, the only possible ways that can happen is if we give it up. 
if we give up holiness, if we stop choosing the one thing necessary, or if we choose something else. If we put something else in the middle, then it knocks holiness out. So if we take, um, for instance, our state in life and put that in the middle, or if we take our job and put that in the middle, or if we take our entertainment or our um, leisure and put that in the middle, then it bumps holiness out. So again, Jesus promises us that if we choose the one thing necessary, holiness, it will not be taken away from us. So if we are to lose that holiness, lose that sanctification, which we learned is the will of God, there are two, I think, two primary ways that can happen. One, we just don't desire it. We don't sit at the feet of Jesus. We stop choosing the one thing necessary. Then holiness will not be in the center. Or two, we put something else in the center. As soon as we put something else in the center, that other holiness is, is put off into a, it's, it's out of order, it's disordered, it's put to another ring, it's put on the outskirts of it. And at that point, Jesus does not have complete reign of our heart. He is no longer sitting on the throne of our heart. I also like to remember that I can always be holy. I can always choose holiness. It doesn't matter what happens to me in my life. It doesn't matter if I lose everything. I can never lose my holiness if I continue to choose that and rely upon the divine assistance. So I could be put into uh, some type of concentration camp, but you can't take away my holiness. I can put under some severe persecution and threatened with death, but you cannot take my holiness. Um, I can lose my job, I can lose my state in life, uh, my, my spouse can die, um, I can, uh, maybe I really like to play golf, but then I break my leg and I can no longer play golf. So I can lose it all, but there is one thing that Jesus Christ says, that will never really be taken from us, and that is holiness. And so when we look back at this chart, we can see that we might lose our leisure, entertainment, maybe we don't have any money to do that anymore. We could lose our job. Um, we could even lose our spouse, um, but holiness remains. This is the one thing necessary, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is that pearl of great price that we will sell everything for. He is the hidden treasure in the field. Remember, he's that hidden treasure that is invisible we must say Lord I want to see you remember his words for what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and suffer the loss of his soul this is mark 8 36 and so we hold on to the one thing necessary we say rely on Jesus all the time we say Jesus I need you Jesus I want you Jesus I love you come to my assistance um, we daily want to be in his word listening to his word asking him I want to see you Jesus and we continue to do that day in and day out because he is Emmanuel yes we are in this exile we are in this valley of tears mourning and weeping in this valley of tears but we have God with us yes with us invisibly but with us with us in so many different ways and he will stay with us Emmanuel God with us and so we are in exile but we have now reached Emmanuel God with us let us stay then with him thank you for joining me uh, for this 19th lesson I hope you uh, watch the next lesson the final lesson in this animode course in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit